Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be joined by George Morris, a partner at Simmons & Simmons. George and his team have been instrumental in supporting the crypto community from a regulatory perspective for many years now. George, thank you for joining us today. No problem at all. Good to be here. Why don't we start by you telling us a little bit about yourself and what you and your team do at Simmons? Yeah, sure. So as you said, I'm a partner at Simmons & Simmons. Um, by background, I'm actually a technology lawyer. So I qualified back in 2009 um, uh, as a tech lawyer doing uh, IT software licensing, procurement, that kind of thing. And it is still my sort of my bread and butter day to day. But I picked up my first crypto client very, un, you know, very randomly, basically, back in 2015. And that was obviously where when crypto was quite small. And since then, really, the, the sort of practice has exploded. Um, you know, 2017 was a great year for the industry and it was a, a good year for us as well with sort of building relationships and more projects coming online and more advice being given and uh, gaining experience across a really broad range of stuff. And that, that's led us now to sort of be in a really good position when it comes to sort of advising uh, exchanges, custodians and other kind of market participants globally, really. Um, and we're really sort of really proud to support the industry. Um, and sort of really proud to, to have got ourselves into a position that means that we're sort of able to be kind of trusted advisors, having sort of looked at, you know, a really wide range of crypto issues across the globe sort of for the last five or six years now. Thanks for that, George. All right, well, let's dive straight into uh, the topic in hand today. So I've got a number of questions for you. So question number one, um, the deadline for businesses to register um, for the UK's money laundering regime expired on the 10th of Jan. Can you just give us some background into this regime, um, specifically for UK businesses, and perhaps start with why it came into effect and what it's trying to achieve? Sure. So the registration requirement comes from um, the Fifth Money Laundering Directive, which is a, a piece of European legislation that was passed a number of years ago and required all European member states to implement um, money laundering uh, requirements uh, for a number of different types of businesses, but within that, that list was included uh, crypto asset exchanges and uh, crypto asset custodians. Um, 5MLD, as it's, as it's known, was drafted quite a long time ago. I can't remember the exact date, but it's, it's a good three or four years ago now, potentially. Um, and so it was quite, by the time actually it was implemented in the UK, it was relatively out of date um, because obviously the market had moved on quite significantly after 5MLD was originally drafted. Um, so what the UK did as part of its implementation of 5MLD, which is where it takes the requirements of the European directive and implements it into local U UK law that is directly applicable to people uh, under the UK's jurisdiction. They uh, obviously updated the existing money laundering regulations to, it, to require crypto asset service providers, exchanges and custodians broadly um, to, to have to undertake uh, anti-money laundering um, uh, checks and ongoing uh, you know, compliance requirements with respect to that in the same way that banks and asset managers and others um, have been required to do for a very long time and law firms as well. Uh, you know, I'm very familiar with these requirements because we have to do them ourselves when we take on new clients. So um, exchanges and custodians came into scope of having to do money laundering checks and ongoing compliance requirements from the 10th of January 2020. That's when the rules actually came into force. Um, and so there was this requirement that said for any businesses that were uh, operating uh, a registrable service exchange or custody in the UK by way of business on the 10th of January last year, 2020, you would get uh, a grace period um, whereby as long as you applied before the 30th of June, the FCA would guarantee that you would have at least a, a, you know, a yes or a no on your application. Uh, and as long as you had the yes or the no by the 10th of January 2021, i.e. Sunday last week, um, then you were able to continue operating. And so that was the grace period. It was one year and you could continue operating until you got your yes or your no. And they told us that if we got our applications in by the end of June last year, then we then we would be sort of guaranteed a response before the deadline. Um, now, of course, everybody knows that's kind of not how it worked in reality. Um, I think for various reasons, the FCA uh, had delays. And so by the time we got to the 10th of January, I haven't checked the register recently, but I think there's only four businesses on there. Um, out, yeah, and the total number of applications is rumored to be in the hundreds, low hundreds. So yeah, they've got a lot of work on. Um, and so they decided that they would, uh, they would extend the time period and implement these temporary registration uh, uh, requirements. So 
for anybody who had applied for a life uh, for registration by the end of the 15th of December, um, then you're able to take the benefit of registration up to, I think it's a, it's a point in July uh, of this year. Um, and effectively, it's the earlier when you get a decision made by the FCA, yes or no, um, or uh, when you get to the end, to, to the July date, that's when the temporary registration finishes for individual businesses. So what, we're end, what we've ended up with is a situation where you've got existing businesses, the vast majority of which are now on the temporary registration regime um, and who are sort of sat uh, either engaging with the FCA or waiting to engage with the FCA and hoping to get registered as soon as possible. But they have this sort of extended grace period up to July this year um, to enable the FCA a, a greater period of time with which to assess applications and, uh, and make a decision on each individual one. The, and then we have, alternatively, we have new businesses who are sort of left waiting for registration. But if they were new businesses and they weren't operating their crypto asset service as at the 10th of January last year, they have to wait to be registered before they can start their service. And so there are numerous businesses out there who have, read, who are, who have, have applied for registration and who are sat there waiting for an answer from the FCA and they can't launch yet because they don't have the, the they don't have the yes or the or no, hopefully not the no. And they don't get the benefit of any grace period or temporary registration regime. So they're kind of sat in limbo. And so that's where we're at. We've got existing businesses who are operating last year, they've applied, they're now waiting for an answer, but they can continue operating because they're on the temporary registration regime. And then you've got new businesses who weren't operating on the 10th of January last year who have applied. And are waiting for an answer and uh, are you know sat there you know ready to go but can't launch yet because they don't have their registration yes it does seem that both camps whether you're an existing business and still waiting for an answer or a new business um, that's waiting for your application that can't launch until they've received the yes or no is somewhat of a precarious situation and you touched on the number of businesses that have been accepted or been granted licenses um only four out of possibly hundreds um so let's touch on that that's that's rather interesting so in your experience George why do you think it's taken this length of time to run through the applications do you think it's possibly due to um, the actual number of applications versus what was originally forecast, or could it be to do with the um, uh, complications uh, around the business models, or a combination of both, or, or something else? Yeah, I think there's there's a there's official reasons and there's probably unofficial reasons. So, the official reasons that the FCA gave for the for the the reason why there haven't been many businesses registered is because they, uh, they had difficulties due to coronavirus. They were expecting to be able to, to physically interview people. And they said they weren't able to do that um, because of coronavirus. Um, but the issue with that uh, is that obviously that, that issue isn't going away. Um, you know, they're not going to be in a position to start physically interviewing people over the next uh, six months before the, you know, the temporary regime runs out. So that issue remains. The other issue that they raised was the quality of the applications they were receiving. Um, and I can see some, you know, some argument there. You know, there's a wide range of different businesses that are applying, and I suspect there are some who are putting in place very, very comprehensive, very high quality applications. You know, to the same standard that you would ex that you would be putting in if you were applying for an e-money authorization or a, you know, even a MIFID, you know, investment firm authorization. Those are very, very complicated applications, and they require a very high standard of application to pass. And I think there are some firms who are putting in those standards of application. And then there are other smaller firms who, of course, don't have the resources to engage compliance consultants or lawyers or, or other professionals who can help them with FCA applications. And they're kind of you know, winging it slightly. You know, they're putting in, they're doing what they can based on their understanding. And quite rightly so. You know, that, you know, some some very small businesses can only afford, you know, a certain amount of support. Um, and so I suspect that they've got a really broad range of sort of applications in terms of the quality of them. Uh, and they have they actively have said that one of the reasons why they, they have not managed to meet the deadlines because they weren't expecting, you know, the sort of the quality has not been as good as they were hoping. Um, those are the two kind of official reasons. I think there's like probably some unofficial ones as well that we can, they can we can probably surmise that they weren't expecting this many applications, I would bet. Um, I think when you look at some of the consultations uh, and papers that were coming out of the FCA before the registration came in, the the sort of market analysis the FCA were doing was sort of suggesting that there were kind of 
10 or 11 exchanges in the UK, sort of actively operating in the UK. And so, you know, if I was to guess, and I don't know this for sure, but if I was to guess, I would imagine the FCA was not expecting, you know, there was this huge flood of applications um, that came in because their market research hadn't really sort of taken into account the very broad range of businesses that are actually operating here. And there's a number of reasons for that. I think the first thing is, is that the, 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 the definition of who has to register is actually very broad and quite unclear in places. So I, before I, I generalized to say it was exchanges and custodians, and that is true, but also it takes into account people who are doing ICOs. It also takes into account people who are, who are arranging or making arrangements with a view to the exchange of crypto assets. And, you know, you tell me what that means. You know, there's a, there's a definition under MIFID of arranging or making arrangements with a view, but we haven't had any guidance from the FCA about what that actually means in practice. And so businesses that are marketing on behalf of entities that are doing exchange or businesses that kind of introduce customers to exchanges, those can arguably fall within the definition. Um, and that raises big problems because it means that they quite a lot of businesses have taken the uh, the approach of sort of being you know, risk averse and deciding to try and apply um, in order to, to, to make sure that they're on the right side of the line if the FCA takes that view that they would be included. But it, it, it raises a real difficulty and obviously increases the number of applications. Um, and I think the last kind of unofficial reason for the delay is probably because I suspect that the, the range of applications has meant that they've had the, the getting a really diverse set of documentation in terms of the different business models. And the and and the whilst the FCA are doing a really good job of understanding crypto, it's you know, each business model in crypto is very different and very technical. And you know, dealing in different assets, all the different assets have different attributes. Um, they're doing things in slightly different ways to to try and uh, grab different market niches, and all of these things mean that that these business models are not standardized. You know, you're not just looking at another kind of you know securities brokerage, which is a complicated business, but relatively cookie cutter when you look at other securities brokerages that the FCA may have reviewed in the past. I suspect each crypto business that's applied has very, very big differences between their business models and has required a lot more in the way of um, resource to understand um, and, and actually sort of, you know, get under the hood to be able to understand whether there's, um, you know, whether they should be authorized or not. Um, so there's a there's a really broad range of reasons, um, the ones that we know about and the ones that we can guess. And I suspect all of them are, are, are causing big problems for the FCA. Yeah, thank you, George. It does seem like a bit of a perfect storm. And, and we know that our neighbours on the continent are also going through the same issue. So it's not just uh, the UK that's implementing this. And yeah, that, that's right. And actually, it's, it's important to mention that, that the FCA is not an outlier on this. You know, we've had delays from the, from the in the Dutch government, uh, the, the, the Dutch central bank, who has got a registration requirement up and running. They had a deadline um, to register by the 21st of November of last year. And they had to implement a sort of temporary re regime of sorts because they got hardly anyone across the line. Um, and we've seen similar in France as well. Um, you know, as you say, this is not an isolated issue, um, and it, but it's it, it seems to be something that regulators are really struggling with at the moment. Yeah. Um, OK, so you touched on um, previously the, the extension that the, the community gratefully received in, in, in December because there was lots of uncertainty around whether businesses were going to be able to continue to trade post the deadline of, of the Sunday just gone. Mm -hmm. um, may I ask then, why, why do you believe this came so close just within a few weeks of, of, of the deadline, the announcement of the extension? Um, and in your experience, do you think the, the industry and your clients uh, find this, this, this positive? And also final part of the question is, could this have been done uh, differently? Yeah, so um, why it came so close to the deadline? I mean, I know that the FCA was working very hard, particularly in December, to try and, you know, see what, see who and what they could get through the door um, in terms of registrations. I think the reality is, is that they were they were struggling with how they were actually going to do it. I and mean, one of the key things you have to be aware of is that the the FCA is not is not the entity that makes the law here. It it simply applies the law that that's given to it. Um, and obviously it consults on how it's going to do that, etc., and provides guidance. But ultimately, uh, the Treasury is the one that that sets the rules. And the Treasury was the one that set the rule that everybody had to be registered by the tenth of January. And so the FCA couldn't just move that date. Um, had to work with that in some way, shape, or form. Um, now, 
the reason why it came so close to you know the deadline and obviously we had christmas as well just before then i have no idea but i can guess a few things i mean one one way in which the, the way in which they actually operate the temporary registration regime as i mentioned before is that you had to have applied before the end of the 15th of december now if they had, if they had announced it earlier they would be giving they would obviously be shortening that period um by sort of reducing uh, you know uh, effectively sort of with an earlier date would mean that fewer people would be able to get into the temporary regime um but if they had if they had done it earlier they probably would have instigated a little bit of a rush of people trying to get their applications in um you know in advance of that deadline to be able to take the temporary registration it's a slightly unusual position sort of the the 15th of december thing did lead to some people trying to rush in their applications um and obviously that's not beneficial for the fca at all because they don't want these you know applications that have been rushed they want you know clear and well thought out applications so they definitely wouldn't have wanted to to have um, instigated a situation that would have led to a rush of applications so they obviously uh, they they uh, announced and they gave us the date um but those two things were so close that it would have prevented too much of a rush they obviously slightly took a, took uh, advantage of the fact that we had the christmas week coming up um which was helpful because it meant that you know a lot of people were already sort of starting to down tools, which would have helped with respect to kind of avoiding this rush of, of half-baked applications. Um, so that's why I think that it was uh, why it was done when it was done. Um, the other reason is, of course, there's a lot of hoops that the FCA has to jump through to do this kind of thing. They can't they can't necessarily just go ahead and instigate a temporary registration regime. They've got a lot of people to consult and agree on that they're going to do that. Um, and that is a yeah that that is obviously a process that they would have had to go through, and perhaps that just took time. I, I expect that was probably the case. Whether the temporary regime has been well received, I think overall yes. I think it, it probably is beneficial. I think if if I was to if I was going to bet on it before it came into place about how long the grace period, the extra kind of you know grace period would be up to the up to the July date, I think um, I would have said it probably wouldn't have been that long. Um, because it, because I just wouldn't have thought the FDA would give that much grace. But then equally, um, we have to take into account the fact that the FCA still has a lot of, you know, big mountain to climb, a lot of work to do with all these applications. And they had to give themselves, you know, a, a good amount of breathing space or else they risk having to extend the temporary regime deadline, which would be a, a little embarrassing. Um, so I think generally it has been well received because it, it gives clarity to people who are already operating. Um, but on the flip side, it gives concerns to people who are not yet operating the new businesses that are waiting for applications uh, to be approved. And that's a you know, th that whilst there have been discussions apparently to suggest that all these applications would be run in parallel, existing in new businesses, I would be concerned that there is definitely a that the that sort of if the FCA had to uh, apply its resources to to one of those two categories, they probably would choose applying the resources to the um to the existing businesses where they've got a deadline rather than to the new businesses who they can probably hold at, at bay slightly but that's that's you know that's a little bit unfair you know the new businesses really need to get up and running the existing businesses are uh, are sat there kind of you know happy knowing that they've got till july now or, or until a decision is made that kind of gives us a bit of a two-tier system um and, it, and particularly when you look at what the market's done over the last month or so you know a lot of new businesses have missed out on a lot of potential revenue there and that's a yeah that's a that's a real downside for them um the last part of the question was around whether it could have been done differently i mean there are other ways that it could have been done yes that's right none of which are particularly well trodden for example um they could have asked hmt to to have moved the deadline but that would have been quite a lot of pain and suffering of of administration um so probably not the best way of doing it the other way that could have been done is by allowing people effectively putting out a statement that, that says we will not enforce against you um you know after the 10th of january but then that again leads to a lack of clarity around sort of you know how long that grace would be applied for and effectively it all ends up in the same place as sort of, of this temporary registration regime in, in in everything but name obviously the ideal would have been to have all of these applications processed before the deadline but clearly we're in a we're in a different place now and we can't we can't look at look back with with uh, hindsight and just a final question on the uh, temporary register do you think there are any uk firms that missed out on the deadline and possibly would have to cease trading this week 
I think there are. Yeah, I, I, I think there are. I don't know of any um, because, uh, yeah, obviously we've been trying to publicize this as heavily as possible, make sure everyone's been applying. There definitely will be people who are um, who are either currently in breach or have had to stop trading. I know that there's been communications having gone out from the FCA to, to people who are in the process to sort of make clear what needs to happen post 10th of January. Um, and of course, there will be a question mark as to what the FCA is currently doing about the people who have applied and therefore sort of, you know, put, put their heads above the parapet with the FCA, but obviously haven't been registered and aren't on the temporary regime, temporary registration regime. There's a, the FCA is sort of on notice that these people are either, you know, close to starting to operate or maybe are operating. And, um, and you know, so the FCA may be interested to see what their websites say over the next few days um, to see whether they've ceased trading or whether they've modified their business model to bring themselves outside of the registration regime regime. But yeah, I'm almost certain that there will be there will be businesses out there who are really struggling at the moment with you know uh, decisions to be made about what you know what to do, either cease trading or sort of amend the business model to try and avoid the regulation, which is quite complicated. Okay. Um, all right. Well, let's move on to our fifth and final question. This is coming at it from the sort of fees and the cost for businesses to, to apply. Um, I'm going to focus on the, uh, the one-time application fee. So this is what everyone's going through now. So this is the upfront um, cost to apply. Now, we note that there were two levels of fees previously, so £2,000 for the smaller business with a uh, uh, low income versus £10,000 for, for the larger business with a greater amount of income. We do note from a recent public consultation that's currently open, called the FCA Fees and Levies Consultation, that the proposal is to do away with the lower band, the £2,000 fee, and have a £10,000 application fee fixed for all size businesses. Could I just ask, George, do you think this is proportionate? And in your experience with customers, do you think that's fair and balanced? Yeah, I mean, it's... a it's a difficult one for businesses to swallow, to be honest. I mean, the the ten thousand pounds is a is a painful amount of money for some businesses that are applying. Um, most businesses will be able to scrape that together. You know, even the smaller ones, uh, you would have thought they'll probably be able to, but obviously they won't like it. But you, then you have to combine that ten thousand with the the difficulty and the cost of having to go through the application process. Um, and it's worth bearing in mind that the application process is not simple. It, you know, it, it says it's a registration process and it is a, it is a registration rather than an authorization or a license. But equally, the process itself is, is very complex. It requires submission of a lot of documentation, policies, procedures, intra-group agreements, um, all sorts of other stuff, descriptions of the business, marketing plans, um, uh, pro financial projections, et cetera. It's a lot of work to create. Um, and for a small business, the majority of that documentation will not be, you know, available. They'll have to create it, and so you've got the ten thousand cost of of uh, actually applying, but you've also got the cost of putting all that documentation together and the time cost as well as the potential advisory cost. And if you're spending ten thousand on the application, you probably want to hope that you're going to get a yes at the end of it, and so you're going to be incentivized to be looking for support um, to make sure that your application is as high quality as possible. So you're almost kind of forced into, by, by having to do the 10K payment, you're almost forced into a position where you, you it's best practice to be getting somebody to look at your application and providing you know, uh, a, a view on whether it's any good before you put it in, um, in case you spend the 10K and turns out that your application is so poor that the FCA won't register you and then you're, you know, you wasted the money in the first place and you can't get, you can't start operating. So, I think what it does is it massively increases with the registration and the fee, it massively increases the barrier to entry for crypto businesses in the UK um, to a point where small businesses, many of which are going to work hard to try and avoid the registration requirement in the first place, either through carrying out activities that aren't registrable um, or alternatively seeking to rely on a jurisdictional argument to say that they're not within the jurisdiction of the FCA and therefore not registrable. Um, which is you know, a difficult argument to run, but there are, you know, there, there's guidance on the F, from on the FCA website about sort of the jurisdictional uh, tests that the FCA will apply as to whether someone's in scope or out of scope. And I suspect people will be looking at those quite closely to see whether they can try and sort of see if they can avoid the registration requirement, as opposed to paying the 10K and going through the pain and suffering of creating the application, and then having to wait 
up month for an answer um, from the FCA before you can start. It, it's it's probably going to push a lot of people to to try and avoid the regs rather than actively complying with them. Unfortunately. Thanks, George. That's a very good point you make. It's not just the financial costs, it's the additional resources. And that's great to have your personal insight as to how complex um, and arduous these applications can be. Um, and we we know that we do not want to put barriers to entry to, to startups, technology firms uh, coming to the UK and, and creating jobs and improving our economy. Mm. Okay, well, that's it from me. Um, all that's left to say is thank you ever so much for joining us today, George. If anybody wants to contact you, where can they find you? Uh, so, well, uh, I'm on the Simmons and Simmons website. So if anyone needs to drop me a line, please just go on the website and search for me and you'll find my details. I'm there. But um, yeah, thank you very much for having me. And it's a pleasure to uh, to be asked to come on.